So uh, let's talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, behavior-driven development and how to make it work for yourself and your project with your tools, uh, like in a very lean way, sort of, to speak. But first of all, you know, let's, it's early in the morning, let's do a little bit like warm-up exercise. Everybody just like lift your hand. I just want to see like who was really too tired to do this this morning. <laughs> okay, good, this works. So basic mechanics are there. I would like to know, you know, who, who am I talking to? Who are you guys? Who calls himself a developer? All right, that's almost everybody. So let's do the counter check. Any designers here? It's like, who calls himself? That's great. Okay. So two. Was there a third one? I feel like there was a third one. All right, two at least. That's cool. Uh, any managers who is like not really programming anymore much? All right. That's great because this is. Like, I'm always hoping like to get some managers because this is mostly you know uh, for like the communication between developers and managers. And I always feel like, ah, oh, there's no managers. But of course, it's a technical conference. Like, it's uh, developer-heady. But um, I'm happy this is changing, because every year there, there are like more non-developers or like former. So anything else I missed? Like who, like POs, PJs, I don't know. Like, I'm not hip anymore. All right, so um, I, that's, those are like the broad categories that I like to, to use anyways. So now that I know you, let me introduce myself. My name is Nicholas Martins. You can find me on the web, on Twitter, and on GitHub. And I started uh, programming like in early teens with QBasic. Any QBasic people who started with QBasic are like, all right, this is getting less and less every year. Um, well, then I did some Power Java, uh, Java, mostly web stuff. Studied in Munich at the Technic University. <laughs> Worked at ResearchGate for a couple of years, mostly with PHP. That's where I picked up all my PHP knowledge. And now I'm a freelance consultant in Berlin. Um, so this is where I uh, get a lot of exposure with startups from like early stage projects, stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. And I, I consider myself a software engineer. Um, I like the engineering part because it's not, I mean, the whole planning, you know, and like building stuff. Like that's what engineers do, right? But for me, an important part about engineering is not only thinking about your problem and how to solve it, but also to improve the process of solving a problem. So this is what we usually call methodology, right, or methods that, um, like, to identify the like hurdles that you find in every project and uh, good ways to get around them. Because there are certainly similarities between every project. So this is where I found, or like, how I found behavior-driven development through this, uh, looking into, you know, how how can I become better at uh, building stuff, at solving things, and. The question, of course, you should always ask in the beginning is, why do we even need to do this? Why do we need methods? And, and why do we need something like behavior-driven development? And it's mostly because, OK, so this is, I mean, we're mostly developers here. So this is us. I hope you can identify. Um, you know, it's, it's a little, little sad-looking guy, uh, almost, because his life is very hard. Because he has to work with these things, with the computers. And they're stupid. I mean, they're awesome, but they're really stupid. And they take everything you tell them very literally. So like, even if you tell them something ridiculously contradictory or something like that, they'll do it anyways. But it gets even worse, because he also has to work with those guys. You know, We call them, sorry, everybody, uh, the manager type, but we call them the business, the ties. You know? And we're a little suspicious of them, right? Because they talk a weird language. They talk like, and they always like, seem to only care about money. So it's a little bit odd. And it gets even worse because we also have to work with these guys, our colleagues. We, you know, we'd rather just do our own stuff, like, right? But uh, we can't. We have to work in teams to collaborate. Usually systems are too big for just one person. So that's awful. And um, so we need to do the thing right. And it turns out it's really tricky to do the thing right. Even if you know what the thing is, just to teach it to that stupid machine is surprisingly difficult. And we're still struggling with it even like 60 years after the first line of code was written. And we not only have to do the thing right, we also have to figure out what the right thing is to do. And that turns out is also surprisingly hard, because nobody knows what they really want. You cannot just ask them. You have to find it out like step by step. It's awful. So, uh, And the last thing is, of course, we have to do it together, because like, collaboration is key. And how? What are like some common tools to, to solve this problem? Well, we have like specifications or stories. So we try to make clear, you know, like best be before we even start, 
working on the project, right? We say like, okay, what is it what we have to do? Okay, we have to do this and this and this and this, and how much is this gonna cost? So we try to get that straight. And then, um, well, the best thing, I think, of like making sure that you did the thing right is to you know, test it. And of course, you can test it yourself, or you can teach the machine to test it, which is even uh, better, because then you don't have to do it yourself, and the program is always like the lazy type, right? We, we love automation, because then we don't have to do it ourselves. Um, so that's a good idea. And then, of course, in order to collaborate, we need to describe what we're actually doing, and I mean, what is in the code, but we need to describe why we did what we did, right? Um, what our intentions were and how this thing is supposed to use. But the problem with these things, or at least in my experience, is that um, the specification always leaves something out. It's never quite, never answers all the questions. So it doesn't matter how much time you spend uh, writing a good story or a good specification, when you implement it, you always realize there's something we forgot. So you always have to go back and then there's confusion and then you realize, oh, there's something big we forgot. It's terrible. And then tests. I don't know, anybody who's like big into test-driven development, who loves it, enjoys it? Really, only? Oh, okay, that's not too many. Uh, well, I'm a big fan, obviously. But if you have a lot of tests, then they sort of become their own problem, right? Suddenly you have a lot of tests and then you have to maintain them as well. You have to maintain your production code and the test suite. So that's suddenly a lot. Um, so, and then documentation is basically by definition outdated. Like the moment you wrote the documentation, it's probably not even up to date anymore because somebody changed something in, in the code. Um, so, I don't know, like who has ever written like, or like uh, found a piece of documentation which was not true anymore and it cost you like half a day to find out that it was actually documentation. Okay, so this is actually a common problem. I have this all the time. I'm always very suspicious if I find documentation. Uh, I always try it out first. So, you know, now comes the good part. If you combine all these three things and you try to like, find a common uh, denominator of, of what uh, like specification, tests, and documentation has in common, you find that they're actually all just examples of how to use the system, right? The specification describes a use case, an example before the system is built. The tests describe an example for the running system and the documentation describes something like about the system after it's built. So we can, we can try to extract it and, and say, okay, they're all examples, so why don't we use this met method called specification by example? And now maybe you're wondering, uh, what I thought this is about behavior-driven development. What is spe specification by example? Uh, well, has anybody ever heard that, actually, that term, specification by, okay, there's one, two, two people, three, all right. So this is a very, not very known term. Um, but maybe you've heard of example-driven development? Who has heard of that? Nobody, okay, that's even less. Uh, agile acceptance testing? Wow, okay. Uh, acceptance test-driven development? There's a lot of those, okay. There you see. Um, and of course, behavior-driven development. Who has heard of that? So obviously, Dan North does the best marketing of them all because um, this is the term that stuck around. But I feel like, you know, for an industry or for like a field that spends most of their day naming things, we're sometimes surprisingly bad at naming things because all of these are very similar things. Um, they, they have a huge overlap. And even worse, if you ask like five people what behavior-driven development is, you probably get five different answers. And this is not only uh, here, this is the same with like automated testing, you know, there's no really consensus of what a unit test is, what an acceptance test is, what a system test is, what an end-to-end -end test is. We have no idea what we're talking about, which I think is, is weird because that's our main job, right? Is to like make up concepts and find name for those. Um, so this is the main reason why I like specification by example, because I'm actually not sure if I'm up to date. I don't think there's, is there a book about behavior-driven development by now and I totally missed it? There's no, right? Okay. Yeah, but none, there's no book called Behavior Driven Development, right? So that's always my problem because if you want to be able to talk about something, you need to like, know what you're talking about. So you have, to need, you have to have a common understanding, right? And if it's just like a bunch of blog posts or somebody describing like, a nice idea 10 years ago and then it went in like 100 different directions, then um, you, don't, you cannot really agree on something. And this is why I like unknown terms better, like specification by example, because then at least, you know, I can tell you what I think, what, or what the book says that specification by example is, and we kind of have to agree on that. If you think anything is not really good in that book, 
you can write your own book. But at least we have something, some corpus we can agree on. And um, so I always have problem pronouncing that. Goch, Gochko Achik wrote this. I forgot when. I think 2008 or something like that. And um, he, he tried really hard to find good names for things. Problem is he didn't find very sexy terms. He calls it validating frequently or refining the specification, what we might call refactoring, or illustrating using examples, what we might call like specs, or my favorite, automating validation without changing the specification. We might call that continuous integration. So he, he's, like, he tried to find his own terms for a lot of things that already have terms with the hope that, you know, uh, to have a better definition. And I, I appreciate that. So this is why I'm using it. All right. So this is, um, I'm going to call it specification by example from now on. And you'll see why, because it has the word example in it. And I really like that one. But what is it really? Um, it's not a project management like method. So if you hoped I would like tell you how to manage your projects with um, specification by example, sorry. And it's also not a tool. All right, so this is something I find a lot, is that behavior-driven development is basically uh, like synonymous with the various tools, with Cucumber, with Behead, like Gherkin. They think this is what behavior-driven development is. But it's really, it's really not, because it's something about communication. All right? it's, a, it's, it's a way to bridge the gap between the ties and the glasses, between the uh, business-oriented stakeholders and the technical-oriented stakeholders. This is what it's for me. So you don't need heavy tools. You don't need a new uh, like software to do it. You can just do it with your current tools, with your current process, and you just have to, to concentrate on the communication. So this is what I'm going to concentrate on. As I said, there's, this, there's those two main actors, and a lot of companies I work at, I always feel like they're fighting. I always feel like, you know, it's like, oh, we need to refactor this. No, we don't have the time or the money, but quality, but money, but, you know, time to market. And they can't ever agree on what is, uh, what is more important. And I think that's okay because, you know, our job as engineers is to make sure, like, we do the best we can on the technical side. And the job of, of the business stakeholder is to make sure that he does the best for the business from the business side. And they are sometimes at odds. But that's okay, and I just see like a lot of times it's like taken personally, you know. When I tell I tell somebody, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. This needs to be fixed asap. Then and there, like you know, first we need to find a good client. We are in, we're in the same boat. We're finding this for the same cause. So this is important, like to you know, realize logically, because yeah, as I said, um, the the business people that think about you know features, ideas, the the bottom line, of course. And uh, technical people, they think about the structure of the system and how they're going to build stuff and how they, you know, the awesome technology. And there's sort of like a, a disconnect between the two. So to put this in words, developers care about implementation and uh, vision capabilities, sort of like feature sets. This is what like, uh, marketing or business people think, um, think about, right? They don't care about how it's implemented. They, what they care about is what can they sell to the customers? What can they tell to the customers? Like, look, we have this awesome thing. You should give us money. Um, that's, you know, because in the end, you need to be paid, unfortunately. Uh, so in, in between, we could say there's some, if we, you know, try to like, define an ontology here, you know, there's a feature set, which is like a whole bunch of features, maybe something you can, like, um, like a, uh, a reason to buy uh, your system or to give you money. And then there's individual features, and you can break them further down into stories and scenarios. This is what, um, anyway, so the specification by example does. So, um, and this is how, how the gap is bridged, okay? Because we say, uh, like, those three things is something that is still close enough to the implementation because scenarios is basically just a specific, very specific specification. But it links to the features, so it's also interesting to the business. That's like the general idea. So how exactly do you do this? And this is where it ties together with uh, what Emily said yesterday, because just always bring everybody together at the beginning, like everybody, all the stakeholders. Make sure that you know the people with the original ideas are there, or like you have to care about uh, market, like the uh, the analysis people, the testers or QA people should definitely be there, and developers. You know, and it should be like not too many developers necessarily, like a nice 
you know, uh, five, six, seven people, something like that. And um, it's going to be difficult in the beginning because everybody speaks their own language. So you might want to have also like a moderator to make sure that people, you know, don't drift off into their own things too much. Because what you need to write is you just write down examples, okay? Or like uh, stories, basically. Just like how is this system used? There's no form. You just write it down very loosely. But at the end, you make sure you have like a bunch of examples. And then, of course, you want to make sure that the more important are on the top. And you, you think, you know, what, how is the system actually used? Not what is it, does it have to do? What are the like uh, features or something like that? Just how is it used? Just describe the user story principle, right? That's not, not something um, that, is, that is too unknown. But the difference is that you use these examples and actually implement them. So you turn them into automated tests. And that's the tricky part. And then they can evaluate themselves. So that's the, that's the difference to like, you know, something like story mapping or, uh, or Scrum, where you also have user stories. But these user stories, they always stay in their own, right? They stay like a little post-it, and then maybe you move it to done. But there's no like, uh, hard link to the code like between the post-it and the code. So these examples you actually write down in code, so to speak, and then they can run themselves. Um, so ha let's, you know, let's use an example to describe the specification by example, because I love examples, so let's give an example. So we're in this company called Amanots.com, and uh, this guy, he has a great idea. He says, you know, our competitor, he offers free delivery, so we should do that too. Let's offer free delivery. And then you're like, uh, OK, but for everybody? No, no, only for like uh, VIPs. All right, so if a VIP orders anything, he gets free delivery. No, 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 only uh, like if he orders five articles. All right, so if they've ordered five articles of anything, he gets free. No, 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 only books. All right, all right. That's confusing. You know, maybe it's a great idea. Maybe it will, you know, generate a lot of revenue. But let's write it down as specific examples. And when you write down examples, you want to concentrate on the key examples because they also might get a lot. If you try it uh, to describe the whole triangle, for example, with every point, you have a lot of points. But if you only concentrate on the corners, they're actually enough to describe the entire triangle. So this is like my analogy um, uh, to, to, do, to say, OK, you don't have to have all the examples, only in the important ones. And I'm sorry I cannot get more concrete here. But that very much depends on what your actual domain is. But um, you usually get a feeling for it. So as an example, we say, you know, VIP customer with five books gets free delivery. Check. But if the VIP customer has four books in the card, he doesn't get free delivery. OK, so this is the example, uh, the difference between a specification. And the specification, you might say, if he has less than five books. But less than five can be anything between zero and four. So in an example, you want to have like a concrete number in there. You want to say, if he has four books, he doesn't get free delivery. Of course, you could say, if he has three books, he doesn't get if he has two books. But that would be over-specific, uh, over because if we make sure with five, he gets a free delivery, with four, he doesn't, well, then it's most likely that with three, he doesn't neither. And you might want to have, you might want to you know, put an example down if you're worried that you know, it's not understood. But usually, people are really good at uh, generalizing. And a regular customer with five books doesn't get free delivery neither. And a VIP customer with five washing machines doesn't get free delivery, of, uh, like, uh, obviously. And now is a tricky one, right? VIP customer with five books and a washing machine, does he get free delivery or not? We don't know. And that would have been probably something that would have been, that would have been missed in the, in the specification if you just say somebody with five books gets free delivery because you don't know. So we have to decide. And in this case, we just decided he doesn't get free delivery. We could also say he gets free delivery for the books, but not for the washing machine. So, but these are the, the, the tricky edge cases that um, when I, whenever I do these sessions, we find them surprisingly often. And it's nice to find them early, because those are the, 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 the interesting parts, the ones that really stress your model, um, where you have to, like, like re weird edge cases, and as a develop, like I'm personally really bad at coming up with these. So uh, usually, like the QA people or the or the business people are better. So these are the treasures, and um, you know these are also the annoying like exceptions, but these are the important ones. 
Now, how do we put all of this in sort of a framework? And um, what I love using is system theory because it's so simple. What defines a system? Well, that everything outside it is not the system. That's it, it's very simple. So we can say a system always has a border, so if something comes in and something comes out. And we can give it names, we can call it input and output, and then in between, I didn't find really a good name for that transformation, I don't know. Like input is, input is transformed into output. Mm. Well, uh, design by contract, anybody? Very few, okay. But this is what uh, this is called in design by contract, the precondition and the postcondition. So I thought those are better names, but then I'm still missing the name in between. Uh, I called it, does, does design by contract actually have a name for, for the thing that happens between the precondition and the postcondition? Not really, right? Okay, let's call it the action. So this is like your framework of thought, okay? You always think in threes. Everything has three, uh, three uh, like states, a beginning, a middle and an end, right? This is like how every story, like I'm talking about fairy tales, is made. And it's, it's very helpful to put it in this way because then you can just say, okay, great. So we just have, we can just put it in a grid because we have input and output. We can make it like a truth table sort of and just iterate through all the examples. We say VIP with five is free and then all the other ones are not free. And this is a, a nice approach. I personally don't like it too much because it's not very flexible. And also the, the thing that is happening, the action is not even in the table because it's always the same, you just abstracted it away, but it's, it's where, the, where the interesting part is happening, right? So the, what I prefer are sentences. And this is where, where you're like, ah, you said you don't want to use Gherkin, but now it's going to get Gherkin anyways. So um, the difference is though that the sentences, they use uh, English or like whatever your language is, and they use the ubiquitous language. So this is a term from domain-driven development, which means that whatever you call something, you know, if you call it a customer in the example, it should be also called a customer in the code, and it should be called a customer when you talk to your colleague. You shouldn't call it a user or an account or whatever. You, know? uh, you have to make sure that you use the same word for the same concept. And you can use that very nicely in those languages. So, uh, and you, you can also map the three states to words. So this is where the whole given when then comes from, right? Um, it's just a nice structure to put those three states into, uh, into sentences. So we're still at our example, right? So given I'm a VIP customer, and given I have five books in my basket, when I check the delivery options, then the delivery should be free. All right. So this. So who's actually using like uh, like Behat or like Gherkin or something like that? All right, so like uh, about 10. So this should look very, very familiar to you. But maybe you notice a difference because when I, uh, the, the, the um, companies I see that use Behat, they a lot of times go like test through the UI. Who tests through UI? Uh, okay, about half of the Behat people, all right. So, um, for me, that's, that's not what the examples should be about because the UI is not the ubiquitous language usually of your domain unless you're doing UI development. Um, usually, it's, it's, you know, your domain is, is not just I click on a button, but is I check the delivery options, all right? So by having to make this to come up with, like, what does the user actually do to find out if his, if his, if his delivery is free? Like we're used to that it just pops up like while checking out that suddenly it says, oh, your delivery is free, by the way. But there has to be an action, like there has to be like a, a request or something like that. And just by having to give that a name, uh, you suddenly find maybe a new domain concept or you at least like you flesh out another domain concept. So this is the huge advantage of trying to use ubiquitous language in your examples. You may still map this to a user interface action. If, if you so want. But it shouldn't say if I click on the is my delivery free button because that's not what your domain is about. It's not about clicking buttons. It's about finding out something about the state of the system. All right? So um, that's why you know, this is domain language. This is something that is very important for me and usually the first thing I try to change whenever I see like, um, scenarios that are purely specified in UI. 
And this is also why I'm not a big fan of, of uh, Behead and, and Selenium and that whole suite, because it makes it really easy to test through the UI. It makes it ridiculously easy, which is awesome, because a lot of systems really profit from that. But if something is easy, you tend to do it, and you tend not to think about the alternatives. So you just follow the like, easy path. And this is why I think it's tricky. So instead you know, of using these tools, you can just use your own tools, whatever that is. So I'm going to show you how this looks like in, in, in one version of PHP that I sometimes use. We just create a class. Okay? Just imagine you have a test runner, like PHP unit, and that can uh, run all the methods in something that extends test case as uh, tests. All right? So all you need to do is create a class, and you just give it a really descriptive name, like free delivery to VIP customers. Um, and then you can put the story, for example, you can just put it in a method. You can just say, ah, what is the story? Well, in order to create incentives to become a VIP customer, I want to provide free delivery for VIPs, if you want that. I mean, that's usually, you know, like there's some, there's some uh, people who, who like really appreciate these things. And this way, you can put it in the code. So it's not like, you know, somewhere else, and then you need to find how do these things belong together. You can just put it in there, it's fine. And then each scenario, you can just make uh, a test function. For example, scenario uh, VIP with five books. And usually these test runners, they allow you to uh, specify like a prefix. It doesn't have to be test. It can also be scenario. So this way, everything that starts with scenario is considered a test. And this one is the one scenario where, the, where it's a VIP customer with five books. You can make this method name longer. You can say, I am a VIP f customer with five books, or you know, something like that. But usually this is enough because the content, um, the body of the uh, method, describes precisely what, what happens. Okay? And here I'm just using you know, really long function names. They're basically sentences. If you're used to camel casing, this is easy to read. If you're not used to camel casing, this is probably a little bit harder to read. Uh, so you might also use like underscoring, anything that makes it easier to read for everybody. And the other funny thing is like the second one says, given I have blank books in my basket and then five in the end. So this is because PHP doesn't have infix notation. Uh, and as I said, like this is something um, that I prefer doing because it gets you started more quickly and it allows you to use your tools you're already familiar with. And um, you know, this is, I tried this out with a couple of, of companies and this is actually readable even to non-technical people. So you can just show it to them, and it takes like maybe a day or two, and then they can read it like, like no problem. And you put it like on GitHub or anywhere in your repository, and then they can even browse to it and answer questions like, what does this thing do? And what are the edge cases? They can answer it themselves, because they can just read through this. But of course, you need to implement these methods. Uh, but you can just do that in the same class even. And you just use your like normal mocking that you always do. Um, so this is test automation. Um, if you're not into it yet, then definitely get into it because it's awesome. It saves a lot of time. Uh, you just create like a fake customer and like put, put fake books in it, um, and then you you actually uh, do the thing. So I don't know. Here I call it the delivery manager, and the delivery manager knows if, if the delivery is free. I don't know if that's a good design at all. Uh, I never actually built a, a shopping cart system, um, and but you just make sure that the you know this property is free is true, and that's basically it. All right, so that's all. Um, if there wasn't like this nasty habit of reality to always flow in your f like uh, fly in your face when you don't need it, so but now you know how it would work in an ideal world where everybody you know is, uh, is happy and smiles all the time and always talks nicely with each other. Um, but in reality, you have a couple of problems. First of all, scope of test. Um, definitely want to talk about that because I see that I see a lot of different approaches to it. And um, like I, I don't want to tell you know this is how you have to do it, but this is how it works best for me. And I've tried every other, I tried every option like extensively. But so the, usually the problem is you have a certain scenario, and it like changes one thing in one module in your big complicated system, right? So how how do you make sure that this works? Do you look only at the module, like only at the smallest possible thing you can look at to make sure like this? tiny thing you just change you just change that does like behaves as you expect to or do you find out well does this one module still play nicely with all its uh, collaborators 
does it still like or do I need to like, make maybe change a collaborator because I broke something or should I just like make sure that the whole system still works right these are usually the the problems of test scoping and in my uh, in my opinion which is not a very popular opinion I think that the bigger the test scope the better because you really in the end you want to make sure that your system still works for the user but the problem is of course this tends to be very slow because it incorporates everything. Maybe you have like a database in there or a network call or even like external libraries, like external services that you know don't have like a sandbox, so you can't even really test with them. So, um, but still, like my ideal is the bigger the better. And of course, um, another problem is uh, when you when you do this approach, it's not only very slow, but you also get this uh, test multiplication. So usually you have one happy path, and that's fine. And if, the, if everybody, every user always would behave the way we expect them to, we only had to specify the happy path. That would be awesome. But unfortunately, people do weird stuff. So we need to test all the possible error, like ways that this thing can fail. And if you know, if you do the math, and we think there are three ways for every, like there's a chain of three modules, um, and every module has like three ways something can go wrong. So it has three checks in it. If we wanted to test all the uh, error cases for all the three modules, we end up with 27 error cases, which is, you know, usually you have more than three modules. But if we check each one individually, we only have like uh, the sum of them. So this is math, and um, I, I see this example a lot. In theory, I have never really seen it in reality. Usually, uh, there's a strong correlation between error modes and you don't actually end up with the multiplier. So this is less of a problem for me, but I'm not sure if that's just something that I do weirdly or, or if that's actually true. But this is something you should definitely keep in mind because it, it creeps up on you and then suddenly you have like a lot of tests because you need to check everything. That's awful. Um, and then what people usually, you know, the, the best practice that um, at least maybe still, yeah, is the test pyramid. Who has heard of the test pyramid? All right, not too many. Maybe it's not, not that big a thing anymore. So it's a little bit like the food pyramid, food, food pyramid you know, with like um, cereals on the bottom. You know the food pyramid? Who, who knows the food pyramid? Okay, well, that thing is a lie. Don't listen to it. That's like, that's like some mean scientist in the 80s that got paid off by the industry, right? Don't, don't eat too much cereals. Anyway, some um, sidetracking. The, the, the test pyramid is also sort of a lie. Um, usually, you say, you know, this is the direction of the scope. And then, so that means that uh, like UI tests are on the top. It's like chocolate. You shouldn't have too, too much of them, but you need them sometimes because they're tasty. Um, and they're slow. And then you need to have a lot of unit tests, right? That's what they always say. And then they usually have this like middle thing, which I call system or like logic. And they say, oh, yeah, maybe you should have some of them. Um, but for me, the downward direction really is an optimization. So I don't see why you need a lot of unit tests if they're just an optimization, because it's just a way to make it faster. Uh, instead, what I usually do is I just cut off the top and say, what, is a, what about the system, right? For me, system is, your core of the, uh, is, is the core of your whole um, system, usually, is where the business logic is. So, and what makes it slow is HTTP calls, the UI, the file system, database, all of that stuff, but you don't need it because they're not core. You, you don't develop them, you don't, you know, if you find bugs in them, then that sucks, but um, usually you don't need them. So, just cut them off and just make sure that your system has a really nice way, like a really nice API to set the precondition, to test the post condition, and to invoke an action. Uh, that's a good idea anyways, because that leads to, uh, that leads to better like, system design. So that's what I usually do. I say, you know, I don't do a lot of unit testing because we cannot agree on what unit testing is anyways, so everybody has its own uh, sort of definition. So I do unit, I, I consider the whole system as the unit, but I consider my domain as the unit. So I want to make sure there's a nice interface to that. And the other big problem with if you have a lot of specification is maintenance, of course, because Things change all the time, uh, and that's the only truth about universe you can get. Things always change. So the requirements, the business requirements, change, of course, as well. And uh, you have your examples, you have the implementation of the examples, and you have the individual steps, you know, the, the given when then things. 
So one thing you can do with the steps is uh, if they become too many, all right? So for example, you have a customer, you have a lot of logic concerning the customer, uh, a lot of properties, um, a lot of things, or you have a, like, a very complicated basket, a lot of things you can describe about the basket. You can put them like, into collections, uh, I call them fixtures. It's actually not the, the uh, maybe that's not a good name because fixtures also means something else. But anyways, you can collect them and just say, if you want to do something about a customer, you use this class. If you want to do something, anything with a basket, you use this class. So this is, you can structure it that way. And of course, you always need to refactor the implementation because every time something changes in your system, uh, you need to tie it up with your tests again. So be ready to do that. Be ready to care about your scenarios, about your um, specific automated specification, as much as you care about the production code. It needs at much, as, as much maintenance, it needs as much refactoring, as much design, as much love. So you basically doubled your, your efforts, but it's really worth it, it really pays out, because um, you find defects way faster, and you can and you find weird edge cases way better, and you can fix them quicker. One thing you should never do is change the actual example, all right? Unless something, unless the business changes. But this is something you shouldn't do for optimization. So if you realize, ah, oh, you know, this has like weird side effects, if I only change like the order of, of these things or like reformulate that, it would work better. Uh, don't do that without uh, talking to all the stakeholders, if that's okay. So that's maintenance, it's also a big, um, big real life thing because you have to keep it up to date. All right, so to uh, reiterate, if you uh, manage to, to, to do these things actually, you get this awesome trophy which is a living documentation. And that's for me personally the most awesome outcome of all this um, endeavor. And the living documentation is basically uh, a documentation that validates itself. So you can use it as a single source of truth. You know how we always say the code doesn't lie and if you want to know the truth you have to look into the code? Well the code doesn't tell you why and the code doesn't tell you the intention behind it but the examples usually do and the examples are also much more readable. So if the examples of the documentation also never lies then you win a lot because it can answer the two questions. One of all, uh, one is the most more important question maybe, does it work? Have we thought of all the edge cases? And the maybe more important question is how does it work? Like, if you work in a bigger company, a lot of time you spend just finding out how a certain feature works. Whoever got the question like from, from marketing, how does this feature work? And then you have to dig in the code and find it out. No, that's just me? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, I thought that was just me. So that happens, right? Imagine you could just point them like to a GitHub file and be like, just look it up. Here, we describe all the edge cases, find out how it works. You know, if you feel like we missed an edge case, let me know, we write a new specification and then we make sure that works, which I love. Um, so, once again, I call it specification by example. You can continue calling it behavior-driven development. I don't care, but I like the example in the word. And what it is, it's about communication. It's about making sure you speak a common language. It's not about the tools. It's really not about the tools. And the goal is this living documentation, which, I, which is my favorite thing. All right, so yeah to get the you know, people, it's a humanitarian thing, really. It's not, not technical. Anyways, um, if you want to learn more about it, there's of course the book. I think it's free on the web, I'm not sure anymore. Um, but it's a good book, it's worth uh, buying it. There's the seminal blog post about uh, behavior-driven development by Dan North. That's really old by now, I think. It's like 10 years old or something like that. And I like this uh, blog post, which is uh, how to sell BDD to the business, because that's usually what you need to do if you find out it's a good thing as a developer. You need to convince the business that it's a good idea. And this gives you, gives you really uh, strong arguments because it actually makes sense business-wise. And then, uh, because I you know, was thinking about book suggestions, so I also was like, ah, maybe I have some more book suggestions. Clean Code uh, from uh, Bob, Uncle Bob, uh, best book on development, hands down. I also really, if you, if you like uh, methods and stuff, Extreme Programming is an awesome book and I love the Lean Startup. I don't know why I put them there. Um, I just love books. Anyways, thank you very much uh, for showing up. Um, let me know if you have some questions.